So today I want to uh, talk about a very specific topic and, and uh, address something that is near and dear to my heart is uh, this combination of uh, medical imaging history and physics. And, uh, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about how beetles uh, were involved in this revolution in medicine. So this uh, image on your right, lower right, is of the ME Mark I scanner, EMI scanner, 1971. That was uh, one year before I started medical school. So by the time I entered medical school uh, and finished and went to the University of Vermont, I was a resident who arrived around the same time as their first CT scanner. Uh, that was the only scanner in the state of Vermont and there was a premium on time. And so what was uh, quickly apparent was the limiting factor or probably the main limiting factor in terms of how many scans we could do was the number of slices because each slice took about five minutes. Now, again, you have to sort of reset your thinking about CT. So this is again, some, I don't know, many years ago. And, uh, and so, when you think about traversing the brain in terms of using axial sections, if the sections like this line are perpendicular to this axis, you can cover the entire brain in fewer sections than if you went this way, which is in a sense more logical, you know, sort of top to bottom. But this requires some extra slices. And those slices, of course, are time. And that time is not trivial. If you have to do two or three more slices, that's 15 minutes. So, so the motivation early on was to cover the brain in as few uh, uh, slices as possible. And the way that was done was to angle the gantry. And so this is just an illustration of a, of a gantry on, on a particular scanner that can range from plus 30 to plus uh, to minus 30 degrees. So the gantry was angled to match the head and the way the gantry angle was set was not very sophisticatedly with a laser line that ran from the superior portion of the orbit to the external auditory canal or the orb. So this was the supra, supra orbital meatal line. Uh, and this is how the scans were done for some time until the scan speed picked up. Now, at that point, you might think, well, we would have switched to uh, straight scans. But it be, the other factor that was being considered was the radiation dose to the patient. And it turns out by angling in this direction and avoiding the orbit, the dose uh, to the lens was reduced by somewhere between 75 and 85%, which was a substantial reduction. And of course, you know, based on the principle of using as little x-ray as possible, uh, this was considered desirable. The reality was, though, that many times the orbits would be included either because of the shape of the head or maybe a miscalculation by the technologists. But by and large, the intent was to avoid radiating the orbit. Now, somewhere between that period in time and the introduction of multi-detector scanners, and this is just an image showing you the multiple detectors and the septations between the uh, detectors. And this is, you know, and this is a relatively small array. Uh, one of the arrays has 300 detector rows or more. So these units became larger and larger, and they eventually got to the point where the gantry could no longer be angled. Uh, for example, the, the uh, ER scanner at, at this hospital, uh, the scans are done straight across the patient, and that means the orbit is included in every single scan. Now, uh, these images, just for example, these are of the same patient. And what it looks like, it looks like there's an area of low attenuation here uh, and low attenuation here, but they're not exactly in the same location. This is, these scans are done at different times. So you see a little bit of different anatomy here, structure, and a little, it looks like a different location here. But this is an artifact uh, that has to do with the angle of reconstruction. So this image, you know, label A here, goes with this scout view or topogram, and this scan was presented or reconstructed without any angle. So this is perpendicular to the long axis of the body and, and basically the long axis of the table. And so it makes the lesion look here when you compare it with the same patient is being scanned at a different time when in this case, the technologist reconstructed the slices in this axis uh, to preserve, you know, sort of that traditional CT angle, making the 
uh, infarct appear more uh, anterior in position. So, so the, the way you have to think about this is the scans are acquired uh, in, perpendicular to the table, and then the images are reconstructed uh, with the notion that you're really dealing with a 3D data set, and they can be re reconstructed in multiple planes. And, and of course, as you're well aware, we see sagittal scans and we see coronal scans, which are, which are extremes in terms of uh, reconstruction angles. So when you see CT images, you, you actually are looking at a scan that could be reconstructed in one of many directions. And uh, my experience is that uh, people feel that they need that angulation, that traditional angulation, because that's what they're familiar with. But I can tell you, I worked at a hospital where there were two uh, different hospitals that were all feeding into one reading room. And it turned out that one of the hospitals had stopped angling the scans at some point in the past, but none of the radiologists had noticed. So any notion that there's some uh, virtue in using that traditional angle, I think does not hold up in uh, practice. Now, this becomes a problem when we compare CT with MR imaging, because MR images are performed, are acquired perpendicular to the table. And uh, CT, of course, uh, uh, the traditional angle is that line that runs along the superior or uh, the orbital roof. But even within MR, uh, there are problems in terms of uh, just the patient's head position can change. So unless a finite reconstruction line is used and all the axials obtained in that line, and this is a very recent paper from AJNR talking about um, one of the vagaries of uh, trying to calculate uh, the, um, uh, the measurements in normal pressure hydrocephalus on scans that may or may not be aligned uh, identically. So a problem in terms of CT and MR, and, and so the intent uh, here today is to bring this to your attention, that the scans may not be reconstructed at the same angle. They frequently are not reconstructed at the same angle from exam time to exam time, and especially when you have scans coming from outside the hospital. And so the, a reasonable question is, why are they still angled? Well, and this is, a, this is my opinion, uh, there is no need to shorten the scan time anymore since the uh, scan time is already around 10 seconds or less. I, I would I joke that if it was any faster, we wouldn't be able to charge for them. And it's not for dose reduction to the eye, because if you have a large array multi-detector scanner, the orbit is included in all the scans. And I think in the end, it comes down to we always did it that way. And so it's going to take a while to, uh, to move on to, I think, uh, a new way of thinking about this. And there are some benefits in reconstructing uh, the scans along a specific uh, line. And this could be done from sagittal imaging. This is called the, you know, the, uh, the colossal line. And then you can also use some anatomic landmarks, which are a little more difficult in some patients but this is the anterior posterior commissure line. So if we used a reference line or reconstruction, we could uh, eventually get to the point where the MR and the CT scans look identical. So to finish, I just want to uh, come back to this issue of how were the beetles involved in CT? Well, the, the, the EMI scanner, uh, which stood for the acronym was EMI, uh, Electrical and Musical Industries, was a British uh, company that started out in electrical devices and eventually moved more into music. And in the course of their uh, you know, business uh, decisions, they signed the Beatles. And so presumably uh, this is uh, Sir Godfrey Hounsfield. He was a uh, engineer who had been with the company for a long time. And I can only presume that the money was pouring in and so that no one in the uh, corporate structure thought much about him spending his time trying to figure out the, you know, a, the uh, perennial question, what's inside the box? And so he addressed this from the point of view of uh, some basic uh, physics. And in the process of this discovery, his uh, concept became the first uh, uh, CT scanner. And so this company, EMI, uh, became uh, the provider of the first commercial uh, MR scanner. And in that way, the Beatles were part of the story in the sense that the, uh, the um, financial situation of the company was such that it permitted this sort of basic research from one of their scientists. And uh, God, Sir Godfrey Hounsfield went on to win the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1979, which is really a remarkably short period of time from its discovery.
So there in a nutshell is uh, what I wanted to talk about today, uh, uh, mainly that I want you as you read these scans to be aware of this problem. And if you're ever confronted by any question about it, just uh, use the uh, PAC system to determine what angulation was used for the scans and keep this in mind, especially when you compare CT and MR.